So hello everyone. So I'd like to now talk about um, a really interesting and important application um, of the principles of conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. These two principles are always true. And we'll see just how powerful these principles are when we apply them to understanding the nature of collisions. Okay, so of course collisions happen everywhere from the ultra microscopic scale, say at the Large Hadron Collider, where you have elementary particles coming in and they're interacting through some crazy fundamental forces and then particles coming out. Uh, it doesn't matter. The total energy of everything going in is equal to the total energy going out, regardless of the details of the collision. And the total momentum of everything going in is equal to the total momentum of everything going out, regardless of the nature of the interactions. Okay, and so that happens, you know, it's true like at the elementary level uh, or, or, or um, a microscopic level, you know, all the way up to the macroscopic level where we have collisions between cars. And when that collision happens, there's all kinds of crazy forces acting, metal gets bent, thermal energy is generated and so on. It's totally irrelevant. Okay, the total, the total energy to begin with equals the total energy afterwards. Um, the total momentum initially is equal to the total momentum finally. So momentum and energy are always strictly conserved. And these two conservation laws um, <clears throat> provide a very powerful way to analyze collisions and learn and understand a whole lot about what happens. Okay, so with collisions. Okay, so it's a very, very powerful tool. So we'll start with collisions in 1D, one dimension. And so the particles are just coming in like this and then bouncing off each other. Or they're going like this and, and so on. But they're all just moving along, say, the x-axis. Okay, so we'll start with that as the simplest example. And in that simple, really simple example, we can actually say quite a bit about, um, about um, you know, the before and after um, um, picture. Okay, so let's start with um, drawing this initial picture. So I is for initial and F will be for final. Uh, yeah, F will be for final. And so what we imagine is sort of two objects coming in like this. Maybe it's two cars or something or two billiard balls. They come in like this, they collide, and then they, and, and then they go off. Okay, so we'll have one object has a mass uh, little m, and it's moving with a velocity um, v. And this is a velocity uh, relative to some inertial reference frame. And we're going to take... Um, we're going to take right the, the direction to the right to be positive. So these velocities are really x components of velocities. They can be positive or negative. So we take the right direction to the right as positive. Okay, so when we say v is the velocity of little m, if that velocity is to the right, then we draw, then it's positive. Okay? And then we have another object here, which is big M. And big M could be moving to the right or could be moving to the left. We'll suppose its velocity is called big V. Okay, so we want to imagine, you know, big M could have a slow velocity to the right, and then little m catches up to big M and there's a collision. Or big M could have a velocity to the left, and then they both meet each other somewhere in between here, and then there's some kind of collision. So just for the sake of drawing the diagram, I, I'll just imagine that the velocity of big M is to the left. Okay, so the velocity of big M is big V, and if, I, I'm, if I'm imagining it to be happening to the left, then in this case the velocity V is negative. Okay, so we have that. And then these two objects, they collide together, and then who knows what happens afterwards. It could be that they collide together and they, they're both at rest. It could be that this is a really massive object, this is a very light object, and so this massive, they come together like this, but then they, they go out both like that or whatever. So we have no idea about even the final directions of these velocities, right or left. Okay, so but just for the sake of drawing a picture, I'm going to imagine that the two masses are coming in towards each other like this. One's moving to the right, positive velocity. One's moving to the left, negative velocity. And after the collision, let's imagine that this a little m is to the left and big M is to the right. But we have no idea what happens afterwards. Okay, so afterwards, after this collision, we have mass little m. And we're imagining that mass little m, its final velocity, is negative. So we will denote final velocity with a prime. Initial velocity, v, without the prime. Final velocity of little m is little v prime. And I'm drawing the picture as if v prime, the velocity of little m afterwards, is negative. And we'll also just imagine, for the sake of drawing a nice picture, that <coughs> after the collision, big M is moving off to the right. So it has a velocity uh, big V prime, the final velocity for big M, and that that one is positive. Okay, so now you look at this problem, 
and you say, well, let me see. We're assuming that the masses little m and big M are known. So basically there are four uh, variables here. So the variables are uh, little v, um, big V, little v prime, and big V prime. Okay, and so now we think about this. We have four variables here. How many equations do we have? Well, conservation of momentum in one dimension is just one equation, and conservation of energy is one equation. So we have one plus one is two equations. So we have two equations. Okay, and so what we need then is we have four variables here. So with two equations, we will have to specify say that, that, that two of these variables are given, and then we can use the two equations to solve for the remaining two variables. And so then the question is, we can pick any two of these, say big V and little v prime, we can suppose that those are known, and then we solve for little v, use these two equations to solve for little v and big v prime. But usually when you're dealing with collisions like this, you're imagining a situation where the two initial velocities of the objects are known. Okay, so we will take then these two, it's sensible to take these two as known. And so then we can use the two equations to solve for these two, which we think of as unknowns. Okay? Great. So, <clears throat> so then what we're going to do is we're first going to apply conservation of momentum and then conservation of energy. Both of those are always true. Okay, so let's apply conservation of momentum first. So that says that, that the change in the total momentum of the system, so we're thinking of this as an isolated system here, so there are no other forces. So certainly when these objects come together, there will be forces acting one object on the other and so on. Those are internal to the system, but there are no external forces acting, no gravity pulling them this way and so on and so forth. Okay, so with no external forces, we have this isolated system. And so this is our system, and it's isolated, and so we know that conservation of momentum in that case means that whatever momentum you had to begin with, total, is equal to the momentum you have afterwards, final. So there's no change in the total momentum. So zero is the change in the total momentum. So that's the total momentum, final, minus the total momentum, initial. Okay, and that should add up to zero. So P total final is, so in the final situation that's here, what we have is an object moving of, ma of mass little m moving with a velocity, unknown velocity V prime. <clears throat> that V prime could be positive, it could be negative, we have no idea. Okay, uh, it depends totally on the initial velocities and the nature of the collision and so on and so forth. Okay, so we write always as positive. So we say positive little m times v prime, that's the momentum, the quantity of motion of little m afterwards. If v prime, if this variable v prime is negative, it means you have momentum to the left. If this variable v prime is positive, it means you have momentum to the right. But you always write it as positive m times v prime. And the sign of this, you never put a minus sign in front here, the sign of v prime is just in the variable v prime, which we don't know at this point. So object m, in the final situation has momentum m, little m, little v prime, and object big M has momentum positive m, positive, uh, sorry, positive m times, <coughs> positive big M times big v prime. Again, if big b v prime turns out to be positive, it means <coughs> that this is a positive contribution to the final momentum. If the unknown variable v prime, big v prime, turns out to be negative, then uh, big M contributes an, am an amount of momentum that's negative to the final momentum. Okay, so that's the final total momentum. And then we subtract the initial total momentum. And the initial total momentum is this situation here. We have an object of mass little m moving with a velocity uh, v. Now that v, we could specify, if we specified that v to be positive, then we're saying mv is positive, it has a momentum positive, uh, so to the right. And if the variable v, we choose that to be negative, then mv will be negative, and it's saying that uh, little m contributes a negative amount of momentum <coughs> to the initial momentum of the system. Okay, and then similarly we have an object of mass big M, so it's positive big M times big V. Okay, so these are positive, 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 okay? And the signs are in the variables themselves, okay? So you never put minus signs inside here, okay? 
So great, so we got that. <clears throat> and then what we can do is uh, collect terms that involve little m and collect terms that involve big M. So zero is equal to little m times uh, little v prime um, minus v. Okay, and then plus big M times big V prime minus big V. Okay, and so we can see that this is the same as, um, this is mass times final minus initial velocity. So this is the change in the momentum of little m. So we can write that as delta little p. That's the change in momentum of little m. Final little m, mv, little m, little v prime, minus little m, um, little v. So that's the change in momentum of little m. And then we add to that big M times these velocities is the momentum of big M. This is final minus initial. So this is the momentum of big M final minus the momentum of big M initial. So that's the change in the momentum of big M, which we'll denote as uh, delta big P. Okay? And so this here is what conservation of momentum tells us. Yes, this is an important equation. We'll call this equation number one. Okay, and so you can see, obviously what it's saying is that however much the momentum of, of little m changes, the momentum of big M must change by an exactly opposite amount. If this guy is positive, then that guy has to be negative, so that the sum adds up to zero. So if little m changes, it changes the momentum by like plus five, then big M must change by negative five, okay? So the total change is equal to zero. So this here, you can see, is uh, assuming that little v and big v are known. This is an equation in little v prime and big v prime. So it's one equation in two unknowns. Okay, so we've generated one of those equations that we need to solve for these two unknowns. So now we need a second equation, okay? And that second equation comes from conservation of energy. So energy is always conserved in any collision whatsoever. Even if there's thermal energy generated, metal being bent, sound waves being emitted, all that kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> so zero is the change in the total energy. Okay, and so what is that? Well, let's see. So when we think in terms of, ch of conservation of energy as change in total energy is zero, we're imagining an isolated system. No energy can get in or get out. And so we're just saying E total final uh, is equal to E total initial. Okay, so now then we think about the various ways in which energy can be stored in this situation. Okay, so one obvious way is in kinetic energy. So these are, these are masses in motion, so they can store kinetic energy. And the total amount of kinetic energy in that system could change, could, could, go, could go up or could go down, depends on all kinds of things. Okay, uh, plus, usually it goes down but it could, could also go up if there's some chemical energy in these guys. They touch together and then they explode, right? So stuff like that. So uh, changing kinetic energy could be positive or negative, um, plus um, other forms of energy. Okay, so there are other forms of energy. We're just gonna label it E other, and that could change. Okay, and E other consists of a whole variety of possibilities. So E other, you know, is things like thermal energy, you know, if you take like two um, balls of putty and slam them together, then those balls of putty will heat up. So there'll be an increase in the thermal energy, you know, or <clears throat> maybe it's um, um, energy, say sound. Okay, so when you have a collision between two bill billiard balls, you can hear a cracking sound. Well, that cracking sound, it takes energy to make that, that, uh, that sound wave going out is carrying energy away. Okay, and we're imagining that this whole system is isolated and the energy in that sound wave is part of this isolated system. Okay, uh, could be, I don't know, say the car smashed together and the metal gets bent. So there's energy stored in that bent metal, kind of like a spring, uh, but now that's, that's just sort of like permanently deformed. Okay, so there's energy associated with, you know, deformation of, you know, chunks of metal and this and that, right? Uh, so dot, 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 a whole huge list of possible forms of energy that depend in, in, on the details of the, of the nature of the things that are colliding together. Okay, so we have that. And so, um, so now we can use this and we can, um, we can write down what delta K is and then solve for delta E other.
Okay, so let's write down the change in the kinetic energy of this whole system. So initially there was some kinetic energy, finally there's some kinetic energy. Let's write down the difference of those two. So the change in the kinetic energy will be the change in the kinetic energy of mass little m. It was moving with some, say, slow speed to the right. It ended up moving with a fast speed to the left. There will be a change, okay? Plus the change in the kinetic energy of big M, similarly. The speed of big M going in and the speed of big M might not, big M going out might not be the same, in which case there's a change. Could be positive, could be negative. Okay, we don't know. Okay, so we got that. And so now what is this? Well, the change in kinetic energy is one half m v final squared minus v initial squared. So that's one half little m times the final speed squared minus the initial speed squared. So little v prime squared minus v squared, okay, plus the change in the kinetic energy of big M. So that's one half big M times big V prime squared minus big V squared, final squared minus initial squared. So big V prime squared minus big V squared. Okay, so we've got that. And now comes a really important sort of um, uh, math trick that you should all sort of instantly think about. If you have a squared minus b squared, like we have here, we have a difference of squares here. If you have a squared minus b squared is a minus b times a plus b. Okay, so let's use that little trick here to uh, put this equation into a slightly different form that is linear, a product of two linear things in velocity. Okay, so we've got a... So I don't know if we're going to have enough room down here, but... So let's write it as 1 half m, and then let's... Uh, v prime squared minus v squared is v prime minus v times v prime plus v. Okay. And then we add to that 1 half big M times this difference of squares. We'll write it this as big V prime minus big V times big V prime plus big V. Okay. And the reason we did that <coughs> is you can see that this thing right over here, little m times final minus initial velocity. Well, that's the final momentum of little m minus the initial momentum of little m, which is precisely this thing that we have here, which we called change in the momentum of little m, so delta little p. And then this thing, similarly, this is mass times the velocity final minus velocity initial. That's the moment, the final momentum of big M minus the initial momentum of big M. That's this term, which we called change in the momentum of big M, which is delta big P. And delta big P, we know from conservation of momentum, we know that delta big P has to be the negative of delta little p. Okay, so we've got that. And then, <clears throat> and the other thing to notice is what's left over here is a one-half times final plus initial velocity. If you take initial plus final and divide by two, that's the average velocity. Okay, so uh, little m had some velocity initially, had some velocity finally. What is the uh, average velocity? If it was, you know, plus five meters per second initially and minus five meters per second finally, well, the average velocity was zero. Okay, so this other thing that's remaining here, this one half, and this is the average velocity. That's v little v average. And similarly, one half times the sum of initial plus final velocities for big M is big V average. Okay? Okay, so we got that. And so then we can uh, take the final step here. So we have, um, well, Let's write it as, <clears throat> how should we write it? Well, let's write it this way. Okay, so we see that uh, delta kinetic, the change in the kinetic energy is equal to, let's sort of simplify things. We have delta little p is common to both of these. So it's delta little p times, in the first case, we have little v average, in the second term here, we have, um, there's a minus sign there, so it'll be a negative big V average. Okay, so we have that, and that delta kinetic um, is equal to that, and so, I don't wanna write this, 
Well, let's just write it this way. So that delta kinetic is equal to, from conservation of energy, which is always the case, delta kinetic is negative delta E other. Okay, so let's box in this part of the equation. And let's call this important equation, equation number two. Okay, so now when you look at this, what, we're, what we have is two unknowns, the little v and big v prime, and so we need two equations in those two unknowns. So now we look at this and we see, well, here's one equation in those two unknowns, and inside here we have <coughs> v prime, little v prime and big v prime are certainly inside here. Okay, so this is certainly an equation involving little v and big v prime, but the problem is we don't know what this thing is necessarily. Okay, so we've introduced sort of a new unknown here, and this is interesting. And this new unknown is <clears throat> has to do with um, specifying the nature of the collision. Is it an elastic collision? Is it you know inelastic? That sort of thing. So we really need sort of another um, bit of information about this problem in order to solve. So let me sort of give you two um, two examples, two sort of extreme examples. We need one more equation, which we'll call equation number three. So <clears throat> three. Equation number three. And now three could take various forms. For example, it could take the form where we know delta E other. So uh, for example, in fact, let me just give you examples. Specific examples. Okay? So, for instance, suppose we know that to a very good approximation, um, <clears throat> there's very little of the original kinetic energy in the problem gets converted into other forms of energy like uh, thermal energy, like sound, that kind of stuff. A really good example is when billiard balls collide together. Okay, so sure, there is a cracking sound that's emitted, but that cracking sound has very little energy in it compared to the original kinetic energy in that system. And these balls, they are very uh, elastic. Okay, and so they can, when they when they when they collide together and exert forces on each other, they compress, but then they uh, re-expand again, like uncompress, and release whatever you know spring energy they stored. They convert that mostly back into the original kinetic energy. Okay, and so there are um, lots of cases in which the collisions, in which very little of the original kinetic energy goes into other forms of energy. So suppose we make the idealization that, yeah, none of the original kinetic energy goes into other forms of energy. So we could say delta E other is equal to zero. So that's one sort of uh, extreme example of a kind of collision that's called a perfectly elastic collision. And so if we specify this about the nature of the collision, then that is equal to zero in equation two. And then right away, we have an equation involving just little v, uh, then big V prime. And well, maybe these uh, also these, these original velocities. But we have an, another equation here in terms of little v and big V prime, the two unknowns. Then we have two equations and two unknowns. And then we can solve. The second kind of thing, so this is, this is perfectly elastic. Okay. The second kind of uh, extreme example is suppose that we have a situation where we have these two uh, balls of putty, uh, which, uh, which, which, which we throw at each other, and when they hit each other, they stick. It's a hit and stick kind of collision. Okay, so here's a smaller ball of putty, say at rest. Here's a bigger ball of putty in motion, and then they hit each other and they stick, and the two of them move off together with exactly the same velocity because they have stuck together. It's a hit and stick kind of collision. So in that case, we actually do know there is a relationship between um, the final, the two final velocities, and that relationship is they're equal. <laughs> okay, so little v prime is equal to big v prime. So this is called a perfectly inelastic collision. So now you look at this and you say, well, <coughs> we need three equations for our, um, for our two, uh, sorry, two equations for our two unknowns. Well, here's one of them, and here's the, uh, here's the second one. 
okay, well, we have this third equation, and so this is really interesting. So we can use this equation and this equation to solve for the two final velocities, and then once we know those, we could plug those in here, and then we know this term, and so then we know delta E other. Okay, and so in this hidden stick collision, for instance, of, 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 of two balls of putty, uh, what we can calculate is delta E other. We can calculate, in this case, delta E other is mainly thermal energy. We can calculate how much of the original kinetic energy went into thermal energy. Okay, so then equation, we can use equation two here, and that will tell us what delta E other is, which often is um, thermal energy. But it could be... Uh, you know, a million other possible things. Okay, so very good. So let's do uh, an example um, of a collision in a uh, perfectly elastic um, collision. Okay, that'll be the first one over here. All right, so I'll just erase the board and I'll be back.